All right, um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jens and I'm IGS Director of Industry Member Relations. This panel is about what film and television can teach us about finance. So the film industry has been around for well over a century and of course it went through a bunch of permutations in that time, but you'd, you know, you'd think that there are some similarities and plenty of good practice that will potentially stop the games industry from reinventing the wheel. For example, about 15 years ago, it has witnessed the impact of tax rebates similar to the DGTO, the Digital Games Tax Offset. How did that go? What were some of the key developments and trends and what can we learn from this? To discuss this with me, we have here today Marcus Gilizzo from Timber Games and Firelight Productions. Dr. Jared Reed from the Australian Film, Television and Radio School and Lucy Cook, CEO of Space Draft. Let's start with some intros. Marcus. Oh, hi. Yeah, I'm Marcus Gillis. I'm an executive producer. Uh, I've been... How much of an intro do you want here? Jen's the full thing, little thing? The elevator pitch. Okay. Um, <laughs> the elevator pitch. Uh, okay, so yeah, I've, I've worked predominantly in the film and television business, but uh, about 20 years ago started to spin off our projects uh, initially into um, what we called multi-platform iterations across, back then, clearly broadband, uh, and then have done some spin-off games of some of our films for mobile, which was a lot of fun, and then more recently uh, I've started working, uh, doing some work with Tin Man Games, who many of you might know, uh, on a VR project uh, with, I don't know if I'm allowed to announce who it's with, anyway, so yes, on a VR project, there we go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lucy. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Lucy Cook and I'm the founder of um, a pre-production planning tool for games called Space Draft. Um, my background, I was on film sets for a decade, uh, ranging from indies to 287 million uh, on Game of Thrones. And my passion is about budgets and ensuring there is enough budget broken down into the pre-production stages so it's not all uh, lost when it gets to distribution. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Gerard. Um, my name's Gerard. I'm, um, I'm a senior lecturer in screen business at the Australian Film, Television and Radio School. Um, and there we are really looking, we, we deal with postgraduate qualifications, it's called the Master of Arts Screen Business. But I come from a, an entrepreneurial background. Originally before that was a documentary. Um, uh, Marcus and I crossed paths a number of times, uh, very much in that um, exploratory space as well. So interested in innovation and especially the way that um, the film school recently has been, has been looking at Epic Games, looking at VFX, bringing across, um, um, you know, sort of the cinematic to the, to the gaming and meeting, meeting that in the middle as well. And that's, that's a drive that we've got at the film school particularly, but we're also very much interested in the, in the market, which is gaming, because we, as was noted this morning uh, with the minister, the, you know, the, the film and TV sector is, is large but the gaming sector is larger, you know? So, so it's, it's something that we're interested in and also ways that we can assist people in educational pursuits as we start to develop, you know, courses and content for that. Excellent. Um, all right, well, let's kick this off. Marcus, when we met to prep for this meeting, you mentioned how there isn't, or how much there is very much a crossover between games and film in terms of finance, and that you struggle to find a difference. That's quite the statement. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, thanks. Well, I suppose, I suppose just to clarify, the area in specifically where I'm working in, which is around uh, putting together budgets, financing, the structure of the financing, negotiation, negotiating the deals, um, I had never done a pure uh, game uh, play in that space. I've done a lot of projects in film and TV where I work in that area as an executive producer. And I guess I was honestly really surprised when I uh, first started looking at the agreements and looked at the finance plan for the project I'm involved in and I ultimately couldn't see any difference at all. Uh, the um, If you look at a publishing deal, we call it a distribution deal. There's uh, clearly private uh, money comes in in some form, often in uh, films that's reinvestment from the production company, or in this case the game developer. Uh, but also the way I got involved in this project is I do a lot of work around the producer offset and helping companies with working out how to ensure they're actually going to be able to make a successful claim on the producer offset. And when the digital games tax offset was 
first announced, it was seemed to me like a really cool idea to then see if we could use the digital games tax offset in the same way we use it in the screen industry. And so when I met uh, Neil uh, Renison from Tin Man Games and said, this is how we use it, we realised straight away that what we could do is actually knowing that we were going to get the 30% rebate, we could borrow that money and cash flow that into the project. And of course, it then has a compounding effect as well. So, uh, so that's, we've been doing that for a long time in the screen industry, but interestingly, it took us a good year or two to really work out how to do that successfully. So can I just give a qu very quick explanation of the basic yeah, principle? Okay, yeah. let's just make a budget a million dollars so it makes the numbers really easy. Um, at the moment, before the offset, digital game tax offset came in, you actually had to go and raise a million bucks and that was that. You might be able to get some research and development rebate on the research and development component if you were doing any, but it was quite complex. complex. It was certainly very difficult to borrow against that. Um, and now, if you're doing a million dollar game, knowing you're going to get $300,000 back from the government at the end, you can actually borrow that $300,000 and bring that to the table, which means for investors, be it publishers, government agencies with direct finance or private investors or your own company, you've just de-risked the project by 30%. But also, if you flip it on its head, which is what we then had the big brainwave in the screen industry after a year of we suddenly I went, wow, so if I just say this film is a $10 million film, I can go to market and say, I've got $3 million and I just now need the rest of the money. <laughs> and that was the big breakthrough, was flipping it on its head, knowing that we would, if, you, if your project meets the basic criteria, you can actually take that 30% of the budget to market. And that's extremely attractive. It certainly opened a lot more doors than uh, previously when you just went, I've got a great idea and you have to take 100% of the risk. So in summary, it, it really changed the mindset and it helped to de-risk projects. Absolutely. Uh, I understand that um, one of the things that also happened were a lot of joint ventures and partnerships between Australian and international companies. Can, can you talk about that a bit more and, and how, that, how that happened, what, what it meant for the industry? Yeah, absolutely. Look, the, the trigger for the mergers that ended up happening, uh, joint ventures, partnerships, um, collaborations, co-productions. Uh, the trigger for that was very much the realisation that you could uh, pitch projects that had a much larger scale because you're able to, you know, take this budget to market, so to speak. Uh, what that meant is companies that we had essentially three tiers of companies, companies with revenues under 5 million, companies with revenues about 5 to 15 million or 20 million, and then we just had huge companies with $100 million revenues and there was about six or seven of those. The second tier companies, there were very few. And for the smaller companies, those third tier companies, it was, it was almost impossible for them to be managing three or four projects simultaneously, let alone one really huge project and two or three others. So we worked out quite quickly that if we then started partnering and getting into co-productions uh, with other companies of a similar scale, suddenly we had the scale to be able to take a project to market and give surety to the investors that we could handle a project of that scale. I guess what was interesting, and if this is about things that we learnt, because I would dare tell the games industry <laughs> anything, um, I can tell you about what we learnt, is we learnt uh, to be very careful about diving straight into a merger or diving straight into a partnership. If you instead look at a co-production, it's a form of joint venture, and the best bit is that when you sign the you know, piece of paper, you're actually signing an engagement, not a marriage. And you can get out of that at the end of the project if it doesn't work out and you're not in love with each other at the end. It helps you to then determine what, whether your values as producers are aligned with the values of the people you're working with. And if they are, then great, you can start investigating a formal merger or a partnership. What then happened with those mergers is you ended up with companies becoming acquisition targets for large studios from that came in and bought those princi the principles within those companies. 
and then that allowed those companies to grow hugely, to be able to handle 10 or 15 projects simultaneously. Right, so there, there is a bit of a danger of the concentration of ownership as well later on the road. Um, I would say yes uh, to that. Uh, there was a lot of, there was a really interesting thing that happened and I think the same thing, I guess, might happen in the game sector where Screen Australia then invested a substantial amount of money through the enterprise scheme and effectively trained us up. So we went from being smaller companies who were very focused on the actual project, not on business and management and how to run a large company. By the time you have 25 people, you need to deal with HR and a mm. whole lot of other things. Um, and we, they ran all these enterprise workshops and then they had enterprise funding where they gave up to a million dollars to companies to be able to expand into the international marketplace. They were in the form of part loan, part grant, and that's helped those companies then become, and I, I, if it hasn't already been talked about, I would be strongly encouraging the powers that be at the funding agencies to consider the same sorts of schemes. The issue of the concentration of ownership is possibly an inevitability. Um, and I think as long as the uh, mechanisms for funding out there still recognise mm. the critical importance of very small companies, uh, someone one time said, oh, you know, there's too many production companies in Australia. And I just fundamentally disagree. That's kind of like saying, you know, let's have an Olympic Games, but there's too many people, too many kids running around the track. You know, it's like, well, how do you get great athletes? You have every single kid run around the track until you work out which kids run the fastest. And it's exactly the same. And Hollywood actually operates by having tens of thousands of little tiny operators all feeding in and they, you know, those projects work their way up the system and that's how you end up with the, the successes. I met, the, I met at a pitching session one time, these two guys who said, oh, we've got a really cool idea. Can we pitch it to you? I said, sure. And they pitched me The Walking Dead. Just two guys. They were, they were no production company. So they're really rich now, by the way. <laughs> yeah, like super rich. And they're suing for an extra 100 mil. So, oh, yeah. Yes, it will. Yeah. <laughs> um, were there some potential ethical pitfalls? I understand that the scheme has potentially attracted some cowboys. And maybe, mm. Lucy, that's also something you can comment on, given your long exposure to the, to the industry. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think 30%. 30% of a, of a project uh, pre-funded uh, is very sexy, uh, and you can go away and spend that money really, really quickly without actually building anything. Um, so that's why I think they bring in above the line and below the line expenses as part of that breakdown before you actually apply for that scheme, because not everyone's accepted. Um, on, on that, I think, what, to, to your point about the traditional ways of, of fundraising for film, at least everyone knows what a film is. You go there, you sit there, you watch it, it's done. But with gaming, when you're kind of trying to get budget for digital twins or all kinds of immersive, interactive, experiential content, there is that question of, is this a game or is this not a game? And mm -hmm. I think there are some other grants like the Export Market Development Grant, the AC Grant, that games can actually also apply for, that traditional film and creative content mm -hmm. you can't apply for. Mm -hmm. So it's about how to pitch that, um, the, the concept of what it is that you want funding for. Mm. And in traditional film and TV, we always had a script that you could then distribute and get funding for that content before it was mm. made. But now it's just, there's so, you know, what stage of the game is it at? How much money do you need to finish it off versus, you know, mm. green light it? There's, it's just there's there's less clarity around the expectations of how far pregnant are you in this concept? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I think the some of the, you know, my observations around. I mean, a lot of money needs to go into development for a film or television project, but it still only represents two to three percent of the total budget. Yeah. The pre-production required to uh, make a proof concept or, a, or even a vertical slice can be enormous. It's, I, my, it's analogous to in our sector doing a pilot mm. episode of a TV series, but networks fund that. And that's something that I think will happen now with the offset, the digital games tax offset. If you took out to industry, and I'm going to talk in the larger numbers because the threshold for the digital games tax offset is 500 grand. If you went out to industry and said, you know, I, I want $500,000 for 
you know, minimal viable, uh, sorry, for a vertical slice for a $20 million game that's, well, straight away you're actually going out there with a proposition that's only going to cost that company $300,000, $350,000. And if you convert that from Australian dollars into US dollars, you're down to 250000 US dollars, that's not a huge ask for a company to create a vertical slice where you'll all be funded properly to do it and you're not expected to take that risk yourself. And certainly, if you actually look historically going back 100 years in the screen industry, there used to be an expectation that you would do pay for everything yourself before a studio would even get involved in the distribution. And clearly that changed. And that I think happens the same. to indie games, though. Yeah, but I, I'm, I guess I'm anticipating that that will probably change in the same way it did change in the screen industry. So will that take a hundred years. No, no, I think <laughs> I think everything's going to happen a lot faster because I think the uh, I think the you know the path has been trodden already. That's uh, why we're here. Yeah, yeah, to talk about those those gaps and the bridges and what's similar, right? Sure. Um, yeah, look, I, th this this all feeds quite nicely into the areas that, that I've been dealing with, specifically through research and a whole range of other things. But it's, it's about building equity for producers. And we mm -hmm. have, and just to both points, I think the ethics part of it is incredibly important, and also especially as you're starting to, to form industry relationships. Um, but also the ecosystem that you in, you're involved in has to have a large churn. I mean, what Marcus was talking about, what you were talking about, is that, that, that idea that um, that you've got, uh, you know, innumerate sort of entrants um, that seems to be overwhelming at the beginning. That's very, very natural in the life cycle of, of sort of a new opportunity or new technology merging with some sort of hybrid innovation or whatever, whatever it is in that context. So, but the producer offset when it was when it was established was to actually um, build up equity for producers because producers were, were missing out. Mm -hmm. Everyone assumes that producers make a lot of money. They don't. You know, they they take a, they take the majority of the risk. And they usually are the last people to get paid. So, so what we focus on especially is is that reach into new, into new areas, which we call you know blue oceans from the blue ocean strategy. If people are familiar with that sort of framework, the idea being that you're not in these sort of hostile markets where you know the the it's the the hostile market's red, and the red is because the sharks are eating all the fish. You know, and you don't want to be in that sort of hostile market. Traditional screen industry has also shown us especially in that sort of studio system in America, which is very mature, mm. um, is that it's, it's a hostile market for new entrants. So where is the opportunity? And mm. what you've got in the, in the game sector is a lot of that blue ocean. You've got a lot of opportunity. But how do you play that in terms of building up equity for yourself? Because people are, and just to that point earlier, there was a, a great session earlier with regard to legality and, and accounting. Um, mm. People are going to just take it away from you. You know, I mean, only because you're not, you're not asking for it. Now, if, if George Lucas had asked, not asked for merchandising, you know, would, would Lucasfilm have become what it did? Initially, he wanted to make his, own, he'd make his own films, show them in a cinema. The sound systems were antiquated, so that was his only innovation that he was thinking about. He later then got almost a bankruptcy, and then he started to, you know, Coppola is saying, you know, George, you've got to write, you've got to write, and he doesn't want to do that because he's an editor and he just wants to be left alone. So his innovation has also been in terms of business. Mm. And, that, and that is it's amazing what they did with that merchandise. Yeah. Also, I think, um, coming down to crew, <clears throat> like you, can, you just mentioned you know, some great directors, but if you have an amazing artist or amazing ambisonic special audio mixer or just talent, I think that's a direction that it's going to head anyway, is that you'll be able to green light a concept for a game if you've got certain talent that is basically you know, committed to the project, because just like celebrities in movies, you'll have celebrity art mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. celebrity sound. It's just following the, the structures and the systems that have been evolved in Hollywood. If anyone's been on a, on a studio lot, you've got art department, set deck, costume, your grips mm. and everything. So we're going to have these pockets. And whether we're, you know, collaborating virtually in the cloud to create new kinds mm, of content. Mm. It's just going to definitely replicate the systems that the film industry's had. Mm. Cool idea. It's just replicating what's worked in Hollywood, really, and getting rid of what hasn't. But um, number one that does work is budgeting. Clear above the line, below the line expenses, being really, you know, really clear on your petty cash, making sure that every department has a very clear breakdown that, yep, we're $200 a week. 
uh, budget for just additionals. And I think just these, those little things that the film industry kind of got really used to, like no, no driver has a credit card <laughs> for the company. Just little, little things that we can take away from what worked in film and apply it to the future of games because it's going to be mm. very, very similar. So ultimately, it's, it's a matter of planning. Yeah, absolutely. And planning in advance and, and you know, every, every little bit have, it, have that planned. Because, and, and, you know, I, re I remember when, when we discussed this panel, how we were saying, well, you know, what every great movie has in common is that, you know, it, it all has been planned in advance and every piece is sort of, you know, working with the other one. It's all, it all fits together. Well, you have a financial controller who's basically the god of money. And then they have a very, very scary uh, head of accounts. And then they have like five or six minions. And then you have your, <laughs> it's so true, right? And then you've got your production secretary who's run by the very scary production coordinator who you don't want to cross. And then <laughs> uh, it's just very, very clear of who's accountable down for every single dollar. And that kind of accountability and pre-production planning is just so important, particularly when you're dealing with potentially a lot of uh, different types of people within the games industry mm. and having to all work together. Uh, discipline, when it comes to finance, I'd say mm. it's just one of the most scary line items that could go really wrong. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, last night at the party, I can't remember the name of the party now. <laughs> It was cool. Must have a good one. <laughs> the great big party, I think it was. <laughs> um, I, you know, someone asked what I did. I said I'm an executive producer, and the person said, "Oh, we need executive producers." And I, I just assumed, and I guess there maybe are executive producers in in the games business. So, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. So, the role that in relation to finance that I take uh, is on film and TV projects, and I'm also doing it on this project is absolutely granular with the finance mm -hmm. so it is right down to the micro of you know how much super we're paying on each person and making sure you've got all that sorted out well in advance um, making sure there's a contingency and interestingly I argued for a 15 percent contingency because I heard that come up in another discussion of you know why should we have a contingency and how much should it be um, and I argued for that because the you know, my limited experience and then from what I've understood, it's often very difficult to anticipate two years out when you're developing a game of any scale uh, exactly, well, or even a small game that, that with a small team, it's going to take two years to anticipate uh, what might be happening with the platforms that you're delivering to uh, and what might be happening with uh, just skills supply, which is a major issue uh, in the sector at the moment. Um, but the other one too that I think was a lesson for us in the screen industry was when the producer offset came in, it forced us to get our books in order. Because if you're going to be claiming a offset, you are going to be engaging effectively directly with the Australian Taxation Office to make that claim. It is a rebate on your expenditure, which means you will be talking to people who will be the arbiters of whether you get that rebate or not. Uh, and those arbiters will ultimately be taking that to the tax office and that's who you'll be dealing with. Do you want to explain what a completion guarantor is? Yeah, sure. So we have in the film industry and television business completion guarantors. So they're people who come in and they do two functions, which is they firstly ensure the project in case of catastrophe. And the second thing they do is they actually monitor the project the whole way through. So a simple example of a completion guarantor's role is they will be looking at the weekly cost report. So we, uh, on the game I'm involved in, we cost report regularly, and I track the variances within that cost report to ensure that the burn rate of the contingency is in line with the actual cash flow of the project and the rollout of the, and the actual development of the project and the milestones. So to simplify that, if we've gone and burnt already half the contingency, before we've even got a vertical slice, we've got a problem because there's still three quarters of the, you know, development process to go by the time we get through, you know, alpha and beta and, you know, minimum viable product and so forth. So a completion guarantor will look at that burn rate and will get really involved with the producer and the production team and the director and the creatives and so forth. So 
that's effectively what I am doing uh, on this project and bringing those skills to bear, which are you know project planning skills that could be utilised in any sector, really. Uh, but getting your books in order, uh, I'm just going to make one really simple thing. Pay tax. <laughs> I know that sounds really crazy, but if you don't pay tax, you will have a big problem. And because you are now going to be exposing your books to the tax office, and it's way, if you have to pay tax, you've got a good problem, yeah? because it means you're making a profit. So make sure you pay all your workers' tax, make sure you pay all your super, make sure you have all your holiday pay sorted for everybody, uh, make sure if you've got people on full-time contracts that you've got, they're on the right award so you don't end up with them coming back and making a claim on you. Um, but most importantly, pay your tax because otherwise when you go to do your producer offset claim, the first thing they're gonna do is if it was a million dollar project and a $300,000 claim, they will deduct the tax you owe from that claim. And you will have a massive problem with the lender that you borrowed the $300,000 from. Was that too dramatic? No, I think that made it pretty clear. No one's going to uh, like me. You know, Pay think, tax. I, I, I'm Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 that, that's definitely not a popular thing to say, pay tax. But we learnt we but, had to do this in the screen industry. And a lot of people learnt the hard way when they ended up in serious, serious trouble. So, in fact, companies went under. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I mean, Lucy, as someone who's um, crossed into the game space, um, do you feel that maybe the interactive aspect of making a game poses a bit of a challenge in this respect? You know, in terms of, let's say, bugs, in terms of user feedback and all of that. Like, you know, when you make a movie, chances are your camera is going to work, you know, and, and the, the final product, um, the end user is going to engage differently with it. Whereas, you know, in an interactive product, there may be bugs, there may be delays, there may be, you know, you find that through user testing it's not as engaging, so therefore they are higher cost. Does that pose uh, an extra challenge, given that it's not as straightforward as, as film production, particularly after you know more than 100 years of practice? Great, great, um, Jens. I think we're a little bit more rehearsed due to visual effects. So if you're on a movie, you know, like I was on Gods of Egypt for two and a half years, we had 15 vendors with, like, we've got Rising Sun, we've got Rodeo, we've got Frame Store, we've got ILM, like all the big studios, they're all just punching out visual effects and 3D assets all the time. And so I think, you know, we've been quite mm. rehearsed in that, uh, that discourse between the technical evolution of a, of a script and then the physical. Mm -hmm. I think it's more the game side that, um, that are finding out more and more how important the fundamentals of narrative are um, which is what the script was designed for. You don't just bring all the actors together in cameras and say, all right, everyone, improvise. You know, <laughs> we'd never have Godfather, right? So it's about what does that plan look like? Can you budget on the plan? And that's why we built Space Draft to help gamers or anyone building immersive interactive content pre-visualise a concept and break down the narrative and the story in the world and communicate the why. Why is this important and why is this going to cost X? And once everyone's clear around those expectations, then you can go off and employ other vendors to actually build the magic. But unless you've got a, fat, a, a really solid plan, everyone's going to be singing from a different song sheet. Hmm. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, um, just want to sort of get back to the issue of ethics, because, Gerard, that's something that, you know, mm. you're exploring in your research as well, and, um, you know, and how that ties into building a company vision and identity, which, you know, then reflects one's values and understanding. I mean, th that is something you're exploring in your research, I understand. Um, can you elaborate on that a bit further, what that means for the film industry, and what, what are some of the major insights there? that the game industry can take some cues from? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I, did, um, I did my doctoral studies, and it was, I didn't set out to do a doctorate. That was something that I never, ever thought I would be doing. And, <laughs> um, and it was a long, long journey. And I used a company, and I took it out of the screen sector um, um, completely, and I looked at a whole lot of other entrepreneurial sectors. And then I, I slowly integrated that company back into the screen sector to see how it was 
it was working with um, with government funding essentially, which was which was predominant in the in the in the screen sector. So really coming from that perspective, um, what I, what I found was that there was there was just so much opportunity in the entrepreneurial space that you did need. There was it was the ecosystem as we would later sort of research, especially in Adelaide. I was based in Adelaide at that time. We we looked at the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And in that, um, and I was talking to Marcus earlier about, about this, the, 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 probably the advantage that the gaming sector has over the screen sector, and, the, and I include audio as well, and audio mm. uh, for us is really, a really important sector. Um, the advantage that the game sector has was that you were an ecosystem that was, you, you, did, it on, you did it in an entrepreneurial way, you know, which without that sort of dependence, which I think we ended up in the screen sector becoming dependent upon government, government subsidy. And that was something that you know um, was very evident in the, in the research I did. So we, I moved very much beyond that uh, that notion of of relying upon government subsidy. Um, as as noted, the product producer offset is is designed to build equity. But how can you build equity above that? You know, so it's not just about a focus on getting a tax rebate um, at the end of it, which you'll need. But you'll then need to, and you don't necessarily get the full full amount either. So and you've got to then dole it out. So you're building equity into into the IP that you're creating or managing. You might, be, you might, you might acquire IP. Um, but the, the really important point with, with IP is that what are you going to do with it? It's valuable. Mm. Are, are, how are you going to organize that? And what's, what are the values that you take not only to the creation of that IP, but to the, to the, the collaborations that you have with other people in that ecosystem that you work in? And that's, that for me, I think, and this is through experience, is that I do agree with that, that point that you, you really have to know and trust your partners mm. and, and be really, really confident in what they can do. And there's another part, which is you can never, ever fully know, mm. you know? Like you can be tested also in circumstances where you've signed up to do one thing and then next thing you're doing something completely different. And you think, hang on, how did I get from there to there? Mm. And I didn't start off doing it, doing it this way. So your ethics get challenged, you know? And so that's the thing that, that I've really focused on in terms of, uh, we, I've developed a framework around that, but it's, and I, and I, I give that to my, my students. Um, and put it into, made it, uh, wrote a book about it as well with Palgrave Macmillan. But it's really looking at the way that you deal with time, entrepreneurial time, I think is different to other forms of time. And there's polychromatic time and there's monochromatic time, but entrepreneurial time. How do you deal with you know, the establishment of culture? Because culture really starts the minute that you, you know, um, send an email, you know, make a phone call. You know, so you're, you're actually commencing the way that you're then, then suddenly you're going to get that contract and you're going to be employing X amount of people and they're going to look to you as the model of how the culture works in that institution. And so how, you know, what are you going to model as your, as your value in terms of that, that organisation? And it can seem like it's... Um, it's quite basic and, oh, yeah, when the time comes, I'll, I'll know what to do and it will be fine. Um, it can be undone because suddenly you've entered into a partnership with someone, you've created IP together, you've, you've had the original IP, but you've then worked on it together and now that IP is murky and you, mm. want to, you now want to extract yourself from, that, from that, um, that partnership. So there's all of these things that are, do, do take a bit of planning and I think, I think you know, that those honest conversations up front, but also... Mm. I think I'll just end on this point. The most important thing is to know what your values are. You know, like when, and you can think, well, I, I'm, I'm an honourable person and I've got good values, but what are those values? You know, how do you determine your own values and how are then those values going to meet and be aligned with someone else and their values? Hmm. And every department on a film, they've got different values. Uh, anyone that's been in production, you know, the grips have different values uh, than the uh, than hair and makeup or costume. Some some would say, no offence to grips, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, I think those uh, we we actually had to um, well in the unions with film, you you had to be conscious of hours. You know, if you're on set, you can do be working overtime and overtime. So they started something called French hours whereby you do 10 hours straight without a break, but you can eat on the fly, you know, throughout the day. And there are different, you know, so just because something's set in stone, it doesn't mean that it can't evolve as the demands of the crew or the unions want mm. things to change as well. And I think that's what in, 
games, I guess, it will evolve too mm. as to what those those systems and practices are. And different countries have different practices and different systems, um, according to law of, um, you know, what, what, what have we got to look, up, look out for in terms mm. of, you know, workers' compensation and sure. all, of, all of those mm. important things. Yeah. I've got a couple of points on ethics. Go the... Um, I think there's several areas that are interesting to me, which is financial ethics, I guess, which is, you know, around how you treat any kind of government subsidies that are out there. There's a hell of a lot of really great, uh, you know, attitude and really good attitude around the reality that we live in a land of milk and honey. The people out there who uh, treat it as though it's their right, not a privilege, to be able to access government finance, I find I really don't like as people. Uh, it's taxpayers' money that you're spending uh, when you bring money from the state government here or any of the other state governments or through the state rebates or now with the digital games tax offset. And that money has to be treated with the same care that you would treat any dollar that you took from somebody on the street who had to earn that dollar. And some of the people who then try to work the system in a way that is clearly bending the rules to the point where it's inappropriate what they're doing have caused immense damage to the producer offset. And we then had to spend an entire two years fighting the previous government over a set of amendments to the legislation that had been, you know, that were being proposed that were purely to close down loopholes that didn't need to be exploited by certain people within our industry. And we had to, we eventually succeeded in winning the argument and not having those amendments gone, go through, which would have had dire consequences to small companies. So that's one area that I think is ethically really important and really interesting. Um, and then the other one is uh, creative ethics and the content that you actually create and what that means for people out there. And certainly, um, I mean, this is just me personally. I think there's a lot of people who propose film ideas that when I look and read at the scripts, I just, I'm just shocked. I'm like, you know, which bit of 101 feminism, 101 diversity, you know, 101 anything did you miss in the memo from the last 10 years with these just, just awful, ultra-violent, shitty, crappy scripts that are going to do nothing for our society at all? and uh, except just damage. And it's like, mate, if you can go find someone to privately finance that, you go for it. But as a taxpayer, um, you've got to appreciate that you're actually making content for the voting public. And that voting public clearly have a set of basic ethical principles and ethic ethical ideas, because you can just look at how they vote and you'll understand that and take a quick snapshot of that and then think about the idea that you're proposing to make. And, you know, I think it's a really interesting area, but it's one that I think is really important and I have incredibly strong views on it personally and I get pitched loads of stuff where I just don't even answer the email. Um, so there's sort of two areas of ethics that I think, um, you know, within the screen industry that it's... I, I actually see it as a battle uh, to, you know, I see a lot of ultra-violent material out there that is just unnecessary and I don't understand why we're making it and why we perpetuate it. And I sometimes also wonder whether the NRA is funding the screen industry in streaming. And I also sometimes wonder whether the tobacco industry is still funding the stre streamers. I suspect they are. Stranger yes. Things, 100 cigarettes lit in every episode for a show for kids. Tell me where the money came from there. So that's ethics in a really interesting area. And I have, I'm currently involved in a feature film and I can't tell you how many times I've had to say, no, you can't have people lighting up cigarettes in this film. <laughs> you know, it's like, if someone wants to write a cheque for the whole film from the tobacco industry and pay me double, maybe I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all have our thresholds. Um, <clears throat> um, I mean, uh, one thing you and, and Gerard alluded to is, is the dependency on, on public money. And I've, mm. I've heard it referred to as a welfare mindset. Ah, oh, now, come on. What's the fuel industry? Give me a break. 
What's the, what's, come on, what, what the entire fossil fuel industry is subsidised 50 times more than the screen industry. Anyone who comes in with that argument, it's just rubbish. For God's sake, we get given like, what's the screen, what's the games industry offset going to cost? 50 million a year? There's companies out there that have been subsidised 50 million a week that are digging up coal. Come on. It's like this idea that there's some kind of dependency is just ridiculous. The, the in, entire sectors depend on, go, on tax breaks. Have a look at you know, how many companies don't pay any tax in Australia that are working in related sectors to the game sector. Zero tax. You know, and one of them being we're all sitting here with a device made by a certain company that still pays no tax in Australia. That's one of the richest com cash rich companies in the world. That's subsidy. So if we get from the end, from the if we get from the government a total of a billion dollars between games and film and TV, in a trillion dollar what 1.6 trillion dollar economy, who cares? You should run for government. My daughter's yeah. running for government. Yeah. <laughs> There's some righteous anger there. So sorry, I just had to shut that one down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I just can't stand that uh, when it come, it's it's a purely right wing argument that somehow the creative industry shouldn't get subsidies whilst the fuel industry gets fifty times what we. Uh, just on that point, I mean, I think, and I always ask I always ask our students to look at that. Like, what is the budget being spent on? You know, it's very easy to have a look at the budget, um, the, the the federal budget. Mm -hmm. And when it comes out, see see what's been see, see what the priorities are, yeah. and then you can sort of see. I mean, I, I've I've sort of fi failed to even find the screen sector on it sometimes. You know, it's so, a rounding error. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but I mean, it's in that context. You also think because there is that idea. Well, you know, um, we're underrepresented. You know, there's a whole whole range of things that policy should be doing. But the government of the day is running the country, and so if they're running the country, what are they spending the money on? These are the priorities, and look at it, and you sort of get a, a fairly good idea. And then I think it's you understand also then how that then feeds into Screen Australia's priorities. Mm. And I think we we recently had someone who came and spoke to us from Screen Australia, and uh, it was great because he'd been an independent producer. He could talk to both sides of that, and he could also talk to the things that they were looking at amending within within Screen Australia that were trying to facilitate because what they're they're actually trying to support the screen sector, whereas a lot of the practitioners were feeling that they weren't. Hmm. But just having this conversation, I haven't been in a room where there's been this topic. I mean, how great is that? Yeah. We've got Screen, screen West, we've got Screen Australia, we've got games people like... Yay! Yay. <laughs> Absolutely. It's that dialogue and that appreciation of each other's art and the appreciation that, yes, it is hard to get funding for your projects. But guess what? We still do it anyway, because we love what we do and we're artists. But I just think, you know, thank you, IGEA, for, for initiating this conversation because the more, the more this happens, the less, you know, siloed we will be. Hmm. So. All right. I, I suspect I'm not going to get any funding from now on with my uh, <laughs> awesome uh, tax outbursts. Anyway, <laughs> should we get questions? Yes. I was just about to say, we have about eight minutes left, so here's an opportunity for the audience to ask some questions. If you could please come to the microphone because that'll make it easier to record the whole thing. <laughs> Hello. Uh, quick question about predictability. Um, so I've never made a movie, but I've made games. The challenge, I think, is how predictable it is to ship a game on time, as we've seen in the news time and time again. I don't see the same kinds of news in movies. Uh, obviously, the financing comes hand in hand with that. How predictable is it to make a movie versus making a game? And could that explain some of the challenges that we've talked about today? Yeah, oh. it, that, that, that's actually a good point, and sorry, because mm. that's what I was kind of referring to, Lucy, when I asked about the yeah. interac yes. interactive aspect yes. of making yes. something, yeah. you know, because film, yeah. with the established procedures, established technology, you know, what, what, is, what difference does the interactive, interactive aspect make? So I think it's worth exploring that. Final cut of a game, it's yeah. like, once it's released, development continues, to mm -hmm. Right, yes, sorry. So the, the, the question was, what's the predictability of, of um, you know, making a game versus a movie? Um, you know, it seems that when you make a movie, there is more predictability as opposed to a game, which, you know, upon release may suffer, for example, from bugs. Um, you know, maybe there is poor user engagement um, as reflected by testing. So, um, you know, 
where's what 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 kind of difference does that make? What's what's the impact there? Whereas mm. you know the making of a movie with good planning seems to have more predictability behind it. Well, that comes down to what's called a line producer. So essentially, in film, there's a day out of day schedule. So essentially, you backtrack how long this is going to take and then how much time you actually have to spend on post-production because you've got to hire the facilities and hire the talent for that. So then you essentially schedule backwards, which is also, you know, has it having to depend on, you know, what your distribution deal is. So there's a lot of backtracking, you know, looking backwards to connect the dots. So, and it's pretty tried and tested. And that's why I brought up the completion guarantor mm. because they're looking at that, the, you know, the the weekly amounts of how much you're bleeding and how quickly, so you can essentially reschedule. And then there's all different types of, you know, you've got weather, you've got to have all kind of um, contingency plans, particularly also when it comes to cast. So if you know that Charlize Theron is only available on the 4th of March and the 18th of December, then you've got to schedule your whole production mm. plan around that availability. So that's why planning is so, so, so heavily important because you can only, you can only shoot what it is that you can physically shoot. So you've got to be really, really prepared mm. for that. Mm. Sure. I think I would put it down to these sort of key words around you know, predictability and therefore completion. Um, first of all, technology, where, you know, again, the screen industry's had a 100 and 20 year runway in learning how to make films. And clearly, you know, when you take on a super duper ambitious project, even today, they run late, you know, and it's, you know, but you can still obviously get them completed. Um, I think there's another one, which is just straight out money to get the news out every night in Australia across all the networks costs $600 million a year. It's a huge amount of money. And the reason that they can get it out every night is because they've just got enough money and resources and they've done it enough times, which comes down to repeatability. So if you came to me and said, okay, I want to make a game that absolutely has to be made on time to this day, delivered with complete predictability around the live ops to support that game, I'd say, okay, well, show me 50 games that have been made like that before and we'll make one exact in exactly the same way. We're not going to try and do anything new and different and that's what reality TV is and that's what those you know show what TV drama is you know as in long running TV drama obviously when you get down to shows like Neighbours they're you know stripped five days a week and they're making five eps a week and that's because they've been making 13,000 episodes so I mean I think there's some of the things when it comes to the money side of things that's all about then which is completion bond guarantor looking at the budget looking at the team looking at everything involved or my role as an EP on games executive producer on games is to then look at you know where those exigency might lie and where the risks might lie and to come up with a plan around how to deal with those and make sure that you've got some way of managing them. To your point though about technology, you know, in film we have certain tech like CineSync or the light version called Frankie, which allows you to real-time mark up, you know, the rushes to essentially mm. make see how far away you are from exactly what it is that's going to be in the can at the end of the of the week. So um, yeah. I, there's similar technology for games as well. Yeah, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. question. Mm. Max. Hi, I wanted to ask um, about, you were giving your example of a million dollars and then you'd get your DGTO mm. for 300,000. Do you get a provisional certificate for that? Well, um, I'm a soothsayer and I can tell you exactly what's going to be in the new draft of the legislation, even though I haven't read it, haven't seen it, and no one will tell me what's going to be in it. Um, I think it'd be critical that they have a provisional certificate mechanism within the next draft of the DGTO legislation because otherwise it makes it very difficult to borrow. Uh, if they don't have that, um, it, there, there will inevitably be people or companies who will come up who will be able to vet a project and evaluate it to be able to provide the surety required for lenders. Because what's important here when you go to borrow money in the film and TV business against the producer offset, and it'll be exactly the same, or the post-digital visual effects offset, it'll be exactly the same in games, where there's only going to be a handful of lenders willing to lend you the money where the security is against the IP and the project, not against your home. If you went to a bank and tried to borrow the $300,000, no problem at all. They'll just go, show me the deeds to your home. What's the market value? OK, I'm taking a second mortgage on your home. That's what they'll do. Whereas what we do in the screen sector is we're able to borrow, and this is to very large amounts. There are projects being made for $180 million at the moment where they've gone and borrowed $50 million. 
but the lender lends them the money because there's a provisional certificate. So the government has said, this is a AAA promissory note, in effect, that if you follow the plan and the budget you've put in front of us, um, which goes to the question of predictability, if you show us that plan and you stick to that plan, we guarantee we'll give you that $50 million check. One of the best things about the DGTO is it's not capped. Okay, so that means you can go in and say, I've got a $100 million game, and you will be able to get a $30 million check back from the government as long as you follow the plan. So a provisional certificate provides that certainty. What it requires, though, is administration, and the question will be who's going to provide that administration of, prov of doing those provisional certificates? Because at the moment, Screen Australia does them. Um, so will it be given to Screen Australia? I don't think so. so. But there is a new department that I just found out yesterday from an email from the Ministry that's been created within the Ministry of the Arts that is going to be a really important uh, department that covers our sector of games. There you go. A little bird told me that one via email. Oh, there Old you tech. go. You heard it here first. Yeah. Um, the applause next door. Uh, it's <laughs> him that we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Marcus, Lucy, Thank and Gerard. You. That was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah.